ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المحتد ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وسلم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون وبعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثات بدع وكل بدع ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد Brothers, sisters, respected elders, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, first, if I could ask all the brothers to move forward, inshallah. Get as close as you can. If you need something to lean on, and I'm very serious about this, if you need something to lean on, lean on the brother next to you, even if you don't know him. This is very important. The shyness is in the West, not in the Muslims. They love each other. Their hearts love each other. Even if they pretend to be shy. <coughs> Second, how many of you did not understand the opening Arabic dua? Raise your hand if you quite a few. I'll just briefly tell you simply because it is very important. Um, Verily Allah is praised. Before I tell you, how many of you hear the Imam and others say this at Jum'ah and other times? You hear this dua often, yes? Quite a few. How many of you, when you hear it, you think, when is he going to finish and get to the talk? The reason why you feel this way is because you don't know what he's saying. When you hear the meanings of what is being said, I'm about to tell you insha'Allah, Nothing I can say can compare to it. The points made are so profound that if there is a reason why the Prophet ﷺ, he taught us this opening dua so that we say it in every gathering because every single time for those who seek knowledge, for those who seek to get closer to Allah every day of their life, every time they hear it, it has a new comprehension. Not different, new as in deeper understanding. Same meaning, but more understanding. Inna alhamdulillah, verily Allah is praised. This statement establishes all that is haq, that nothing is significant but Allah Azza wa Jalla. When you look at the star that is so tiny, your eye can barely see. How far, how much further are the malaika in the heavens looking at us? How small are we? How small are we? But yet we think so much of ourselves. Inna alhamdulillah should make a person feel imploded, shrunk, humiliated, humbled. And verses of the Qur'an, knowledge of the sunnah, I will give you two references so you know. The more you study, the more when you hear inna alhamdulillah, the more it affects. So I'll give you two points. There are thousands. Allah says, Azza wa Jal, in Surah Insan, there was a time you were not even mentioned. Forget your name. How about human? The word human was never uttered. No one knowed the species like us would exist. There was a time you were not even mentioned. That is how insignificant we are. أَلَمْ نَخْلُكُمْ مِمَّا إِمَّهِينَ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ فِي قَرَارٍ مَكِينَ إِلَىٰ قَدَرٍ مَعْلُومٍ فَقَدَرْنَا فَنِعْمَ الْقَادِرُونَ وَيْلٌ يَوْمَ إِذِي لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ Azza wa Jal says, did I not create you from something disgusting? No matter how old, if you look at the people around you, no matter how young, we all came from the two fluids that came together. How despicable. 
and it clung inside. And we decided how long it should cling until it gestated. And we are the best to decide how long it should gestate. Woe to those who, who are deniers of truth. Just two references. There are many more like it to make us realize how insignificant we are. Alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, still, nahmaduhu. Even though Allah does not need us, we are insignificant, tiny speck, hardly noticed, unnecessary. Allah is praised without our praise. He does not need us. He does not need us to say Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah. But Rasulullah said, "Still, Nahmadu. You don't need it, but humbly we still praise you." Here, many, many, many pieces of knowledge one needs to understand Nahmaduhu, that it penetrate, that it affect. When you know Allah is Ar-Rahman, what do you know of Ar-Rahman? When you know Allah is Ar-Rahim, what do you know of Ar-Rahim? Ar-Rahman, try to in your minds, imagine everyone in this room at the same time. Try to picture their heads in your minds at the same time. You'll find you cannot. Then in the building, then in this town, how about in all of London? Can you imagine all of the people? And then the world, how many more Londons in the world? Can we imagine them? Can we picture them? Allah Azza wa Jal sees, knows, in, out, up, down, everything. Ar-Rahman, He sustains every human being, every insect, every animal, every fish, every bird, every tree, every plant. Every piece of life in the earth and on it. And He Azzawajal knows all of it, sustains it all, all at the same time, and He does not become tired. <coughs> Ar-Rahman establishes the love a mother has for her child. The love between friends. The love between husband and wife. Ar-Rahman puts His mercy upon creation. Ar-Rahim, he has the most, and Ar-Rahim is the one who gives the most. No one gives as much as he does. To know his attributes, who is Al-Qudus? Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you study his names? Al-Baqi, Al-Mutakabbir. <coughs> These names, when you call someone arrogant, it is an insult, but to Allah it is a praise. He is, the only, he is the only one who has right to be arrogant. So, Nahmaduhu. The more you know Allah, the more you get to know His names, the more you are able to praise Him. Humbly. وَنَسْتَعِنُهُ We seek help in Him. Only when someone knows that the, fir- that the person next to you is weak, He can't protect you from the enemy. But the person on the other side is strong, you stand next to Him closer. He'll protect you, inshallah. When you know Allah Azza wa Jal, you know He is the only one that can help you in any situation. Azza wa Jal says to the whole of mankind, أَمَّنْ هَذَا الَّذِي هُوَ جُنْدٌ لَكُمْ يَنْصُرُكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ الرَّحْمَانِ إِنِ الْكَافِرُونَ إِلَّا فِي غُرُورٍ When they amass their armies to hurt you, who will help you, who will save you but Ar-Rahman? Nasta'inuhu, seeking aid only in Him, having tawakkal only in Him, and He says, Inna Allah yuhibbul mutawakkileen. Allah is in love with those who can rely upon Him. Without this knowledge, brothers and sisters, one cannot understand this. That's why we say, when is He going to move on to the talk? You must conceptualize the meanings. And each time you study, each time you hear it, it has a deeper impact. Wa nastaghfiru. Brothers and sisters, and respected others, we know this is our purpose of being created. To praise Him, to worship Him, to obey Him, to seek His aid from disobeying Him. To seek His help, nasta'inuhu, that He protect us from going against Him ever. Wanastaghfiru, whenever we forget and we slip. Sometimes we do. We forget to praise Him. We forget to seek aid, so we slip and we go astray. Nastaghfiru. We know He is Ghafoor Rahim. He is the one who forgives he is the one who is Al-Afu. He is Al-Wadud. We rely upon these attributes because we know Him. So, nastaghfiru. وَنَعُوذُ بِلَهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا 
I seek refuge in you from the evil of who? Huh? Shaitan. Most people always blame the poor shaitan for their evil crimes. That poor cursed devil is already cursed and is damned for all eternity. He doesn't need our sin also. It is us. The dua says, Anfusina, not shaitan. Ali salatu salam teaches us that our own desires are far more evil. Our own desires have far more strength over us than shaitan. He merely whispers. Sometimes he doesn't have to whisper. Like in Ramadan. He is not there to whisper and we go all by ourselves towards the haram. وَمِنْ سَيِّئَةِ عَمَالِنَا Generally, I seek refuge from the evils of my deeds, good and bad. How can you seek refuge from evil and good? Showing off. It makes the good evil. Worthless. وَأَشَدُوا إِنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ And this makes it worth it for me uh, in any lecture, in any event that all of you bear witness on Yom Al-Qiyamah for me that I said there is no deity worthy of worship, of my love, of my devotion except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I bear witness that Muhammad was his messenger. Allah commands you and I, if you believe, Ya ayyuha ladhina amanu, O people of faith, taqullaha haqqa tuqati. Fear him, love him, hope in him. The amount he has rights over you means limitless. Keep trying forever. وَلَا تَمُوتُونَ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Do not die except as Muslims. This is your salvation. وَشَرُّ الْأُمُورِ مُحَدَثَاتُهَا Avoid newly invented matters in religion. Do not make bid'at al-hasana, they say, in ibadah. This is evil. Do not make these ingressions. They are innovations. They are misguiding. And they are dalala. And they are finna. They will be in the fire. And they will take people into the fire. To perceive, that is the opening time. I don't expect you to memorize all that. But for your own good, try to picture what I said. Maybe draw a picture in your mind, especially you kids. Draw a picture of everything I said and make that picture stay. And then whenever you hear the scholar, the imam, the khatib say it, try to picture that picture. Ramadan is a blessed month, brothers and sisters. And there is an ocean of forgiveness waiting for us in this month. Oceans upon oceans upon oceans of mercy and forgiveness. Every single one of us, brothers and sisters, always sin. And the trick of shaitan, brothers and sisters, is to make us think Allah will not forgive us because of what we did. The crime is too evil. I've done too much. The heart becomes hard. Even if we accept verbally, yes, Allah may forgive me, but has your heart turned back in khusu, in salah? When you pray, do you feel it? If not, then no. You have not believed He will forgive you. You may verbally say so because you're supposed to. But your heart has not accepted because you can't forgive yourself. Every one of us commits sins no matter how long our beards, no matter how white our clothes or hijabs or niqabs. Everybody <coughs> sins at their own level. Everybody slips at their own level. Anas ibn Malik, anhu, he looked at the tabi'i, the people around him, and he said, panicked, worried, concerned, you are doing deeds, you consider less consequential, that if we did them with the Prophet around, it was as if a mountain was over our head. Meaning minor, minor things, those are the tabi'in that we consider super pious people. What about, what would he say to you and I? If he sees what we do, what would Anna say to you and I? These sins are obvious. And they are the minor ones, and they are some of the most dangerous ones. Because when major sins are committed, you know you did wrong, you feel guilty. But when minor things happen, you know there's a famous saying in England, now we don't have this in the States, it's minor. This statement is a trick from the devil, from shaitan. It makes you not want to think about what you did. It's minor, no big deal, small. Alayhi salatu salam was approached by a young man, where will I be in the akhirah? Rasulullah said, Finnar. For him, that was it. Devastated. Why? What kufr? What major sin? He said, No. Minor, minor things. When they come, you do them, it's like a fly on your nose, you flick it away. It's minor. You don't think about it. You don't repent about it. 
You don't seek forgiveness for it. These are like twigs, little small sticks. And on Qiyamah day, when Allah calls these sticks, they make a big pile and they make a fierce blaze. When you light a campfire, you don't light a log, a tree, it doesn't light. You put small twigs around. And then you fan the twigs. Ali salatu salam gave us this analogy. That the minor sins, the small sins that we don't repent for, we cannot afford not to be forgiven. We cannot afford not to seek forgiveness for these crimes. Also, brothers and sisters, shaitan tricks us, makes us think these minor things are no big deal, and the major things Allah will not forgive. You see the trick? Minor things, no point for repenting, it's no big deal. Major things, how can I repent? Look what I did. Allah will not forgive this. And you may say verbally, yes, He forgives. But if you don't feel in your heart when you pray, then no, you haven't believed. You blame yourself. Despair of Allah's mercy. Brothers and sisters, we may also be afraid and intimidated by knowledge sometimes. Thinking, how could I ever be pious? I don't have time to learn so much, to study so much. As some people with knowledge unfortunately become arrogant and make the less fortunate or less knowledgeable people feel small. And this is evil, because Abdul ibn Mas'ud anhu, he set the standard for piety and evil. He set the standard and he did not say knowledge. He said, the difference between a mu'min and a fajr, a pious man and an evil man, is the pious man, he ponders over his minor sins. He thinks, what did I do today? Every day, he thinks, what have I done? He ponders over his crimes, he does not neglect them, he does not ignore them. And the fajr, he flicks them away like no big deal. So the mu'min, the more he ponders, the more he worries, the less he does. The fajr, the less he thinks, the less he worries, the more he does. The standard is set, that all we must do is strive on a daily basis and continuously try our best to Ponder over what we have done. Rasulullah says something, a fact about our humanity, a fact about how we're created. And he set a, a precedence upon us because through his statement, when he said, Kullu ibn Adam this puts us in a position where we can never ever think, today I haven't committed any crimes. So you think. But you don't realize how many people are upset with you. How many people are not happy with you, but they smile when they see you to be polite? How many people may feel betrayed by you? Whatever the case may be. Kullu ibn Adam khata. At every level you will always slip and sin. And we know brothers, can you tell me the people who do evils and commit sins, where do they go? Can you tell me where they go? Hell. That's right, they go straight to hell. May Allah save us from the hell fire. So if the Prophet ﷺ has said, you and I guaranteed are committing sins, where are we headed? The hadith continues. So you're all sinners, but some of you are beautiful to Allah. Some of you are not. I, I'm not judging between the right and the left here. It's just my hand gestures, okay? I don't want anyone to feel insecure. I think you must know something about me. No, I don't. <laughs> And the best amongst you, most beautiful, most beloved to Allah, at tawabun The people of Tawbah, Tawabin, the people who make repentance, they are most beloved to Allah Azza They are the ones, not the ones who never commit sins because they don't exist. But the ones who are constantly checking themselves and constantly repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this month, brothers, do I need to say, you know, we have opportunities upon opportunities for us. None of us are angels, and we were not created to be angels. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you did not commit sins and repent, Allah would remove you, create something else that would sin and repent, and He would forgive you. <coughs> this is a promise of Allah, especially in this month. Especially in this month. The most holy day of the year is Yom Arafah. The day of Hajj. Yom Arafah is known as Yom Al-Istighfar. The day Allah forgives. Inna Allah yakhbiru dhunuba jami'ah. Allah forgives everything. But what about this? Everything. But what about that? Everything. 
Shaitan is sneaky. Except this. No. Everything. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive shirk? No. Does He forgive kufr? No. Yes, He does. Majority people think Allah does not. He does. He forgives shirk and kufr so long as the person upon shirk and kufr repents before he dies. Sincerely. He repents before he dies. Allah forgives every single thing. That's Yawm al This is Sharh. This is a month. Not Yawm. This is a whole month of istighfar. This is the month of mercy. The month of forgiveness. 30 days, brothers and sisters. 30 nights. Night and day. Night and day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to forgive us. You know, the Prophet ﷺ teaches us that this is a must from Allah, and those who do not repent, Allah will punish. So it is fardain. Tawbah is fardain. It is an obligation you cannot avoid. You must not avoid, you must abide by. Tawbah is a must when Allah commands, wa tawbu illahi jami'a. Wa tawbu illallahi jami'a ayyuhal mu'minun al-allakum tuflihun. He says, and repent to Allah all of you. Another important aspect of brotherhood. Don't go repenting and telling the next brother, you go to hell, I'm going to Jannah. All of you, repent to Allah if you desire true success. This is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ayyuha ladhina amunu, tubi ila Allahi, tawbata nasuha. Don't just repent, but make it sincere. Nasuha. That is the condition, brothers and sisters. I'm going to give us a few examples. Okay, we'll come out of lecture mode for a minute couple of examples, because this is, by the way, this is my favorite topic because it's my salvation. This is for me more than anybody else. Let's look at some examples, because some of us still doubt, but my crime you don't know, but what I did you don't know. Or maybe you don't even say that, you just don't realize. When you pray, you just don't feel. Many people pray taraweeh night and day, hoping to feel something and nothing comes, because they haven't accepted in their heart. Allah will forgive them for that crime. All they have to do is turn to Him and say, Allah forgive me. But if you don't say it, if you don't turn to Him, it will not be forgiven. It will stay. You cannot say, but I did good and I was a Muslim after it. No, did you say sorry? You have to still go back and say sorry. You can't just move on. And many sins in our lives, brothers and sisters, we forgot. We forgot to say sorry, we thought he forgot. Maybe Allah just forgave it because he never said anything. He never told us. He never complained. Life carried on, so he must have forgiven me. Look at your salah. Do you feel it? No. Then he has not. It is still there. The black spot. The nifaq. The hardness. You must bring the heart to Allah. He says, bring me qalban salim. Bring me a sound heart. And that's all I will accept from you. I'll give you some examples, out of lecture mode, just for me. And for you, inshallah, I hope it benefits you. Let's look at the beginning of mankind. Adam alayhi salam, the very first man. And Adam was not tested like you and I. Adam did not have to go through the fatana that we are going through. Adam did not have to go through these tests. Adam was in Adam. He was in the garden. He was in the heavens. There, with everything you could want. All Allah said, don't eat from this tree. Don't eat from this place. One restriction only. Just one. Think of how many haram things we have, brothers and sisters. How many things we have to avoid. All Adam had to avoid thing was one thing. Imagine if you and I, Allah said, do whatever you want. Just don't do this one thing. Imagine. Still, Adam is in sand. And insan is made forgetful. And Adam, that one thing, forgot. And he ate. The moment he ate, he realized, I am naked. The conscience, the test, the fitna, the desires came upon him at once. And he was brought to the dunya. He was put into the dunya out of the heavens because of that disobedience. And he panicked. Why did Adam panic? He is a prophet of God. 
He has a connection to Allah. He doesn't need a book. He can just speak to him. Allah responds to him. Adam speaks to angels. You know the angels used to sit and Adam would teach them the name of things. Alayhi salam. So what's his problem? Why is he panicking? He's running back and forth, sweating, panicked, worried. Why brothers? Can anyone guess why? Of course he committed a mistake. But why is he so panicked? He's a messenger of God. Or a prophet of God I mean. Why is he so panicked? Can anyone guess? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> the khushu may definitely had something to do with what made him panic. Because he felt guilty. He felt guilty, yes. But? Huh? He felt that he would be a loser or lost. Lost. <laughs> lost. Because something's missing. Guidance is missing. Hidayah is missing. He is running this way, that way, doesn't know what to do. What's missing, brothers? I'll tell you what's missing. Toba. There was no Toba. It didn't exist. There was no, if you sin, make this Toba. He never read this. He was never told this. He didn't know what to do until Allah taught him. Until he learned that all he had to do was make Toba. And when he learned the dua from Allah, he could not stop saying it. It was the sweetest fruit he ever ate. He cried when he said it. He fell khushu. His heart fell into the earth when he said the dua, Rabbana zalamna anfusina wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al khasirin. He learned this dua. He learned repentance. And it affected him so heavy. It affected him so much that he felt and he cried and it was the sweetest thing he ever ate. Because when you really repent, brothers, nothing tastes sweeter. When you truly, truly repent and put your sin in front of you in Allah and say, Allah, look, I did this. And I didn't stop. I kept doing this. And then I did it like this. And at this point, Allah, you reminded me of you. I remembered you and I ignored it and I carried on doing it. You know what I'm talking about. When you put that in front of Allah, the pain inside, it removes the blackness. It squeezes the heart. Adam alayhi salam learned, and Allah says about him in the Quran. So Adam learned some phrases from his Lord, and he can't stop saying it. He kept saying it over and over and over. That was Adam, the sweetness of Tawbah. And Allah loved him as well. Nuh alayhi salam, another example. He was upon the ark. You know how much we love our children. Nuh loved his son, asked Allah to save his family. And Nuh saw his son, the flood was coming. Oh son, come with me. His son said, I don't think the ark is going to work. I don't believe. But you are my father and I love you. I'm going to climb the mountain instead. Son, come with me. The water will reach. How can the water reach all the way up there? The mountain is tall. Son, come with me. I will be fine, father. Water came, chased the boy up the mountain. The water excelled, kept going higher and higher. The boy kept running higher and higher. And Nuh floated with his ark saying, Son, come with me, come with me. Still the boy said, No, I'll be fine at the top until the water took him and drowned him and killed him. You have to watch your son die to feel that pain. You can't understand it. Nuh fell on the ark on his knees. <coughs> ah! He felt a pain inside his chest. Ah, oh, Allah! My family, you said, my family. Normally when someone loses a friend or a relative, they say all kinds of foolishness. They scream and become angry. And we forgive them, we say, it'll be okay, it's okay, calm down, calm down. What did Allah say to Nuh? Did Allah say to Nuh, it's okay, calm down? Allah said to Nuh, how dare you? How dare you complain? How dare you speak about something that which you have no knowledge. Meaning he was only your son. He was my creation. You wanted him to stay with you on the ark. I wanted him in Jannah. You wanted him to live. I wanted him to have bliss. And he chose hellfire instead. Nuh immediately realized Allah loved his son much more than he did. He said, oh Allah forgive me for speaking about that which I have no knowledge. And if you don't forgive me and have mercy upon me, I will be amongst the losers, amongst the destroyed. Nuh felt the sweetness of Tawbah. Nuh felt the sweetness of Tawbah. 
even in good deeds, Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salam, both of them, they built the Kaaba, they walked around the Kaaba, father and son, picking up bricks, and they put, stacked them up, built this place of worship. While they're doing it, they're making dua and saying, Oh Allah, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us. The sweetness of Tawbah while doing good deeds. Try it. Most Muslims don't do that. Good deeds, I'm doing good, why should I make Tawbah? <laughs> Try making Tawbah while doing good deeds. It's another sweetness. A level very few people taste. Try it next time you do a good deed. Al iftar, give a date to the brother. As you give it to him, say repeatedly inside, Astaghfirullah, forgive me for that, forgive me for that. Here you go, brother, and hand it to him. See how it feels. Notice the difference of that kind of tawbah during a good deed. It's easy to repent when you're in trouble. The examples carry on. Musa alayhi salam. Oh Allah, I want to see you. Show me, please. I love you. I want to see you. Just, just something. It's killing me inside, you know. It's eating me. I just want to know what you look like. Just show me something. And upon the sight of the, the smallest finger of Allah upon the mountain, the mountain could not bear it. The mountain could not bear it. And we know one letter of Quran, one letter of Allah's speech, if it is touched the mountain, the mountain will explode. But so miraculous is human being. So miraculous are we. Allah's created us that our heart and mind can contain the whole book, speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we take it for granted, unfortunately. So Musa alayhi salam, the mountain exploded, he fell unconscious, nearly killed him. He woke up and he thought, whoa, oh Allah, forgive me for asking about that which I had no knowledge. Making tawbah. Isa alayhi salam making tawbah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What was he told? Oh Muhammad, no matter what you do, no matter what you've ever done, no matter what you will ever do, I have forgiven you. Rasulullah alayhi salatu salam, the man of Jannah, guaranteed Jannah. Even his wife said, why do you pray so much? Your feet are cracked, they're bleeding. Why do you pray so much? You promised Jannah. He said, should I not be grateful? Even he, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, would sit in a gathering before getting up. The sahaba would listen. While he's speaking, they would listen. And they would count on their fingers. that he would say, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Before getting up, he would have said astaghfirullah 100 times. That is a sunnah for you and I, brothers. He is teaching us that we should make us hundred istighfars a day at the very least. By action, just to let you know, there's a thing, that, uh, there's a saying that goes, actions speak louder than words. By action, if one does not make istighfar a hundred times a day, yes, it may be laziness and neglect, but by action we are saying, that istighfar was for Muhammad, and he needed to repent, I don't. This is the message from the qalb. Because Muhammad ﷺ did not need to repent. Why was he saying it out loud? To show us, this is what you must do. This is what you have to do. And he did this over and over and over, hoping we would take heed and repent as much as we could. No one can hear Allah speak except be affected in the heart. You know? This is a, a rebuke. After three years of guidance, Allah says to the Sahaba, Is it not time? That the words of Allah should affect the hearts of those who believe? And the Sahaba began to cry. Thinking maybe it didn't affect them enough and Allah is angry. Quran affects the heart of the believer. So listen. Isma' to what Allah says. What does He say to you and I? وَمَا يَغْفِرُ ذُنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ He asks, وَمَا يَغْفِرُ ذُنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Because we are walking around carrying our sins, not repenting. Allah says, who else is going to forgive them but Allah? Where are you taking them? Proof, brothers, that we carry our sins around. Proof is when you're walking and you see a Muslim and you're happy, you're in a good mood. Salaamu Alaikum! And he's walking by and he says, Alaikum Salaam. And he's got a sour look on his face. Inside the heart he's committed sins and they're black and he doesn't feel. Sometimes maybe you're like that. Someone else says, Salaamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salaam, leave me alone, too many salams. There's no khushu in the heart. This is because you're carrying the burden. It hurts on our shoulders. And Allah says, where are you taking them? Where are you carrying these sins? Who else is going to forgive them? Do you not know who I am? Do you not know me? I forgive sins. It's what I do. Don't doubt it. 
وَقَابِلُ تَوْبُ I accept repentance. It's what I do. Don't doubt it. Again, هُوَ الَّذِي يَعْبَلُ تَوْبَةٌ He is the one who forgives sins and accepts your repentance. He says it again and again and again. When Allah created the creation, the Hadith Qudsi, He wrote with His own hand that His mercy will always overcome His wrath and punishment. Another Hadith the Prophet ﷺ said, Listen carefully. He said, every day, at night time, Allah stretches His hand out to the one who is the Masih and Nahar. The one who sins in the daytime, he sinned, he thought no one knew, Allah was watching. Allah sees him. He's walking around thinking no one's looking. No one saw. He comes home and the sin is still in his heart. He eats dinner. He stays watching TV, whatever, ignoring the fact that he's carrying something. And Allah is watching him. The Hadith Qudsi says that all night, Allah stretches His hand out to him. But amongst human beings, we have a certain level of respect. And brothers, they want to reach their hand. And they look, the brothers, they know I won't shake it. And they still can't help. Can't help if somebody gets offended, I better shake your hands, right? <laughs> just in case, you know, just in case. It's a good example. <laughs> There's a respect. Someone stretched their hand to you, you take it. Otherwise it's rude not to. Every night, Allah stretches His hand to the one who sins in the day, saying, take my hand, I'll forgive you. I know what you did. Take my hand, I'll forgive you. And the hadith says, and every day, during the day, Allah stretches His hand to the Masih al the one who sinned in the black night, hoping no one knew. Allah was watching. Allah has infrared, He can see everything. Allah can see. For Him it's no difficulty, darkness. All day Allah stretches His hand to Him, so that He will forgive Him for the sin He committed in the night. And the hadith says, he does this day and night, day and night, day and night, until the day of judgment. Can we still doubt the oceans of forgiveness Allah has waiting to pour upon us? He will forgive anything and everything, every single day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this, brothers and sisters, and we are so rude that we just turn away. We roll over, go to sleep. We wake up and walk out and shove by his arm, by his hand, ignoring. We don't take his hand. We don't raise our hands and beg. We don't take his hand. He says, the trustworthy handhold. He will never let you down. He will definitely forgive you if you seek his forgiveness. This is salvation, brothers. This is solution to all of our problems. The only reason we are in the pathetic, disgusting, filthy state we are in today is because of our own sins. The Mujahideen would go out for jihad in the days of the Sahaba. And the Amir would stop them and say to them, O oh Mujahideen, when you go for battle, make sure you make Tawbah. For Tawbah pushes away that which swords cannot. Tawbah pushes away that that swords cannot push away. That's Allah's punishment. Allah's wrath and anger. Every single thing we do, that's the point the Prophet is making. Yaqub and others said the same. And they said, whoever does not believe Allah will forgive them. He is a kafir. He has disbelief. How can you say Allah will not forgive me? Who are you? What is your sin that you accuse ar rahman of not being able to forgive it? He says in the Quran, my mercy encompasses everything. And you say, yes, everything except my sin. How evil is this assumption, this assertion against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. More disgusting, more sinful is to think He would not forgive than the whatever the sin was itself. What sin could it be that He would not forgive? There is no such sin, brothers. And alhamdulillah, isn't that a huge blessing for us? That no matter what we do, He will forgive long as we repent sincerely. You know shaitan, we all know him, don't we? Very, very well. Better than our own parents, we know him. We're very close with him. He talks to us a lot. Through our desires, he lets us know, I know what you like, I know what you don't like. Shaitan, he made an oath to Allah. He said, Wa izzatika ya Rabbi. I swear by your honor, O oh Allah. 
angry with you and I, that Allah chose us over him, jealous, full of envy. He said, by your honor, O Allah, so long as their soul stays in their body, so long as they live, I will misguide them and destroy them. Take them towards destruction. And Allah said, and by my honor and my glory do I swear, so long as they keep returning to me, I will forgive them. Do what you want. Oceans upon oceans of mercy of Allah upon us. No matter what it is we've done, or no matter what it is we do. Allah says in the Quran, Allah wishes to make guidance clear to you, as He did to those before you, and Allah wishes to forgive you. Another verse, indeed Allah wants to accept your repentance. So over and over emphasizing, I want to forgive you. Inna Allah yuhibbul tawabeen. Allah is in love with those who repent. And you know the one Allah loves? He says, Allah wages war against anyone who hurts his slave, his servant. That state that he says, Allah loves those who repent, who turn to him, and he loves them for this. Analogy, a parable, an example the Prophet gave was about a man. I'm going to give a different parable so we can understand it today. Not, I don't know how many of you lived on the desert, but the Prophet's parable is about a man in the desert. The desert is very hot. Very hot. If you don't wear shoes, it can fry your feet like an egg. Desert is extremely hot. And if you're not with a group, no supplies, you will surely die. Very fast. Man on his camel, walking his camel, he rests for a while and his camel has run away with all his drink and food. He panics thinking he's going to die. This way, that way, running. Finally, after a long time of searching, he gives up and he lays down in his place waiting for his death. I may as well die here. He gives up. But he comes to conscious and he opens his eyes and the camel has come back. Similar to a man, a building collapses. He's trapped underneath for days. He's going to die. I heard of a man in Mexico back in the early 90s, trapped underneath. He drank his own urine for what he could for about six days. Survived and they pulled him out. What a person would do to survive. But what if he wasn't pulled out? Until he gives up. When that man gives up, and then the light comes, someone moves a brick, a light comes and he is saved, how excited will he be? He hears noise, someone's coming. This man in the desert sees the camel, he's saved, he jumps up, grabs the rein so the camel doesn't leave again, and he screams out, Oh Allah, you are truly my slave, and I am truly your master. Words of kufr, he said. He did not mean it. He meant it the other way. He was just so excited that his words came out wrong. How excited is he that Rasulullah he said, when the slave of Allah repents, when the slave of Allah makes tawbah, Allah is more excited at that moment than the man who said that crazy thing. Allah is more excited than that crazy man when the slave repents to him. What is our purpose, brothers and sisters, to go to hellfire? No. Allah didn't create us for that. But it is up to us to decide where we go. It is up to us. I'm going to conclude, inshallah, with a saying from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, O oh my servants, those who have transgressed against themselves, do not give up hope in Allah's forgiveness. Do not give up hope in Allah's forgiveness. Do not despair of being forgiven. Inna Allah jami'a. He forgives all, all sins. Verily, Allah is ghafoor rahim. Full of mercy, full of forgiveness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this gathering of ours as a garden of paradise. May Allah forgive us our sins. May Allah make this Ramadan a month of blessings for all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this month of Ramadan a month of purification for us. May Allah purify us in this month. May Allah remove all the black spots in our hearts in this month. May Allah remove all the hypocrisy that is in our hearts. May Allah guide us to only that which is pleasing to Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite the families who have severed ties. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring the brothers who are no longer talking to each other. May Allah unite us in brotherhood. May Allah unite us upon truth. May Allah guide us to know what is truth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from the day of judgment. May Allah save us from the grave and his torments. May Allah save us from being amongst the damned and cursed by Allah, by his angels Jibreel, by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when they said, 
whoever sees Ramadan come, whoever sees Ramadan arrive, whoever sees Ramadan leave, and they are not forgiven in this month, the amount of mercy we explained, they still were not forgiven, oh Allah destroyed them. And Jibreel commanded, Qul Ameen, and the Prophet said, Ameen. May Allah save us from that dua. Ameen. May Allah make it so that we are forgiven at the end of this month. We also make dua that, oh Allah, please forgive all of the Muslims who have died. We ask Allah to please forgive our relatives, our grandparents, our great-grandparents. The many relatives we promised we'd never forget, but we forgot them. May Allah forgive them now, so that when we die and we are forgive, forgotten by others, that Allah forgive us also. Amen. May Allah forgive 